Welcome to the one within all. My name is Chance and you're listening to Interverse. This podcast is totally dedicated to the artist part of you. And it's my intention and mission to bring you the best guests I can find to inspire and boost our creative perspectives. The path of the artist is often said to be similar to that of the mystic. And the funny thing about the creative and spiritual journeys is how often those roads twist and tangle with the way of madness. Where I've always been curious about the quintessential link between genius and insanity, and it seems more and more relevant as we observe the modern world's tendency to diagnose each and every human quirk in an exhaustively extensive catalog of neurosis. And with the ever-increasing prevalence of prescription pill fixes for every little bump in the mental road for those who are suffering from a lack of self-love, the pressure is on us to rediscover our psychological birthrights as healers of ourselves and our loved ones who work through our blockages with honest self-introspection and radically rational and compassionate conversations. Coming up in this episode is just that sort of conversation with my new friend Don Karp about the keys to overcoming psychosis and neurosis for ourselves. As someone who found the revolving door mechanism of mainstream psychiatric treatments and medicines to be more sickening than the psychological issues he needed help with, Don has since integrated his own personal journey through the turbulent psychedelic 60s and beyond into an empowering story that he shares with others to help them see their own power to choose their state of mental health for themselves. And I'll just throw out there that Don went to the original Woodstock, so that's, I'm sure, going to come up and that ought to be interesting. So let's get ourselves all centered and situated in the present moment together, wherever you happen to be and whatever you're doing, and tune in to the sublime and silent stillness within. Take a deep and thoughtless breath into that space and feel our energies expand and connect. It's all in your head, my friends. And with that, I'm more than ready to jump into the head of this handsome gentleman before me. Everyone, please welcome to Interverse, the original sage of the hippie age, Don Carp. Welcome to the show, dude. Thanks, Chance. So I think it would be great if we just kind of started off similar to how I've seen you do presentations on online where you just kind of tell us about your story and we'll go from there. I've got plenty of kind of points and questions that I would like to bring up, but let's get everyone up to speed to where I'm at with your experiences uh, back in the day. Sure. Back in the day. Well, are we talking about the late 60s? Uh, wherever you'd like to start. I feel like it is kind of important and relevant to talk about, you know, what that time was like for you as a person who had his foot in the door of both kind of the authoritarian academic universe and then the freedom fighting countercultural uh, world that was emerging right then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This was uh, the countercultural world was emerging and I was in graduate school, but I had a younger brother, 10 years younger. He was about 16 then who was fully into the countercultural stuff and kind of dragged me into it, fortunately, because I was getting kind of wasted with academia, especially in science. It's very competitive. And I wasn't uh, able to, with my sensitivity, I wasn't able to cope with all this competition. I'll give you just a, a small example. I went to a lot of presentations of people that uh, were giving seminars about their published or soon to be published scientific discoveries. And at the end of these talks, there was usually a question and answer period. And the people who were able to drag down the speaker in one way or another got a lot more credit than the speaker himself. And I thought this seems like upside down. But that's just one example of the sensitivity issues that I came up with. Certainly there was a long lead into who I was by that time, 26 years old, of uh, growing up in a household where the religion was work, not making money, not doing a good job, not service, but just going to work every day and being on time. You know, the old Protestant ethic. And I think this affected me greatly even today. And my parents were pretty critical of me at a tender age. My voice was breaking and they'd say, speak like a man and so on. So I grew up under feeling that I was ugly, clumsy and stupid. And I didn't know how to express that or where to go with it, really. So that's how I got involved in science. You know, it was a way of doing something that made me feel good, but didn't depend so much on other people. 
And then about that time of 20, a little before when I started graduate school, I got married to this woman. I didn't know anything about sex or love or marriage, but she kind of forced me into it. And then when it didn't work out, she booted me out after a couple of years. So I felt this double sense of rejection from career and from a wife. On top of taking a lot of psychedelics and getting involved in radical politics, I, uh, my subconscious mind, this I learned a lot later, created a scenario, although negative, it made me feel more important. And it was scary to hear voices and things like that. Yeah, psychedelics are definitely something that can accelerate your growth, but also they can the reason why they do that, at least in my experience, is that whatever it is that you're going through or what's, you know, that critical voice in your head that starts with the, uh, your parents and then it's just sort of what you imagine the rest of society must think about you. I believe that it's called the superego in psychological terms. It's the, it's the voice of, it's the imaginary fictional voice that plays in your head that is what you think other people think of you. And it starts when you're a little kid and you first realize that not only do you see the world, but the world sees you back. And that is like, I think that's the foundation of a lot of people's so, sort of psychosis is, is that that voice starts getting more and more out of, sort of out of control and in command sure. people don't realize that their thoughts are not them, that their thoughts are often, they're either just information that you're taking in from the environment or they're some sort of program that's playing out in the case of, you know, the superego and the, the cultural, you know, condemnation that we all start feeling the pressure of. And especially in a time, you know, just a few decades back when there was probably more undealt with trauma from, you know, your parents' generations getting bleeding into your generation's childhoods. And I feel like that's kind of our, our job that some people are definitely waking up to that, oh, we definitely don't want to repeat the same exact traumatic ways of uh, raising children on children indefinitely. I mean, in 25 years, we could have a completely different world if we had a generation of kids that were completely made aware of their own power of thought and their own infinite value as beings and other people's value as beings. So it's very important what you're doing now to continue keeping that conversation alive. And I know when I had my first psychedelic experience, one of the things that actually made it extremely beautiful uh, with uh, LSD, which I, I've done a handful of times, was that I had a strong sense of feeling loved by my mother and father because I had been blessed with a more supportive relationship, generally speaking. Of course, there's ups and downs and bumps, right? But, uh -huh. but I think that that feeling... Those, you know, the, your your psychological sphere goes out to your family. You know, at first it starts with you, and then it's the people in your family that are closest to you, and then friends. And it's like sort of these, they're sort of like these planetary bodies in orbit around you. And if those ones that are closest to you are in a sort of negative relationship, or you're perceiving it as such, or or anything like that, it can definitely cause a lot of destructive gravity on your inner world. I would say, for sure. Yeah, I, I I can still remember the first time I took LSD. I went to this commune that I knew had it, and I asked them if they could give me a dose and if somebody would be my guide. And they said, okay, we'll give you a dose, but we're not going to take responsibility. You're on your own. And that uh, probably started me off on a bad foot right there because I wasn't being supported. Things got brought up about my career and my I was getting so distraught that I started working in a coloring book, cooled me down a little bit. And I thought, well, this coloring book's going to be my dissertation. I just should just hand it in because I'm not going to get through the dissertation. And then I started crying because I realized that eight years of college was in a way a throwaway for me. Hadn't approached a place where I was ready to drop out, but had an inkling. So I agree that the, the psychedelics can bring things up uh, all at once too quickly for your regular mind to comprehend the meaning of. It takes, it takes an especially long time sometimes. Like I've had psychedelic experiences that I continued having integrative thoughts and realizations about for a year or longer. And so 
that's one of the dangers of that sort of tune in, drop out mentality from back then and sort of an unknown about the substance itself and about psychedelics themselves is that you really can go overboard more than you're ready for. And, uh, you know, if you don't have a firm foundational uh, self-love and self-awareness of the fact that, like we were saying, the, th the thoughts are just things and that you get to choose where you're going and you're not actually, things aren't happening to you. Y you know, the universe is responding to you. And the set and setting are so important too. I, I remember in my days, there were uh, laboratories where you could get paid to get dosed, but I couldn't imagine taking LSD in a laboratory situation. It's just so, so uh, extremely opposite of what the set and setting is that I would want to be more in nature and not in a laboratory for sure. In nature, you can have big spiritual psychedelic even experiences without the substances. Nature is that powerful. So yeah, it definitely can ground whatever plant medicine you're working with. I think like if someone's listening and they're kind of curious, like maybe they want to try something like psilocybin or LSD, that would be the set and setting I would recommend with good people uh, that you trust that aren't going to mess with you and might even watch out for you and out in a like, camping somewhere beautiful and you know somewhere safe you don't go don't go where you might have to deal with like a bear while you're <laughs> under the influence right but yeah that set and setting thing is huge but also it's a, not really a necessary tool in your spiritual or personal development unless you really feel called to it and you feel like you know i can handle it because it is almost it is almost just that that certainty alone, like, okay, I'm, I know what, I, I know I can be okay with this, even if it shows me something really dark about myself, that that is a very grounding thought to, to keep. What is, what's interesting is just how different the effect of what is prescribed as like a chronic, for chronic uh, neuroses is than the psychedelic experience, where psychedelics really open you up and your sensitivity is jacked up to level 10 million, whereas a lot of the antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs are the exact opposite, trying to mute everything down. What was your experience with the medical aspect of, you know, your psychiatric treatment and how, how did that, how did you get there, I guess, is where we should start? Well, I was hearing uh, voices. Let me just say that I, I took a number of different kinds of psychedelics and then I got a hold of some opiated hashish which is a very potent form of marijuana. And I was smoking that every day. I had this fantasy that I was becoming an alchemist. And I don't know if you get into this. I don't know if you want to explain it now, but I read one hexagram of the I Ching every day and meditated on that. So I was getting into a very uh, strange kind of space where I wasn't really communicating with people much and just on my own with this. And it, that led to a lot of paranoia. And I had been involved in radical political activity. I was in the core group of the local uh, people who were supporting Eldridge Cleaver for president. And there was, it was known that the FBI was following people. To me, the definition of paranoia is a heightened state of awareness. And that means you take something that's real, but then you might blow it all up out of proportion. So I started hearing groups of people whispering about me. Didn't know what they were saying, but I knew it was critical, and my intuition told me that it was not nice, whatever it was. Wherever I went, I heard these whisperings. I tried to get away from them. I couldn't get away. I thought maybe the dentist put a radio receiver in a filling. Yeah, all kinds of things. I started having flashbacks to my LSD and other psychedelic trips and thought my food was being tampered with, that I was being followed. And I got to the point where a bus would turn a corner and it meant something very important about my life at that time. So to get away from it all one day, this is about a month into these experiences, I drove into the suburbs and I heard a helicopter following me. Later, I realized that this helicopter was really a power lawnmower someplace, but that's what I was going with at that time. And to get away, I pulled my car off the road and crashed into a tree in the woods. Then I went around the neighborhood asking for my lawyer. And eventually a couple of plainclothes policemen showed up. They did a good cop, bad cop routine on me. 
And I don't remember uh, what followed exactly, but my mother wound up bringing me to the state medical facility where I talked to a psychiatrist for about five minutes. And he goes over in the corner and washes his hands, comes back and said that I needed to go into the hospital. And at that point, he was the authority figure. So I trusted him. He didn't offer any alternatives. So I signed myself into the mental hospital. Soon as I got in there, the door closed and I saw the scene there and realized I didn't want to be in there. It is the day room. And the door was locked behind me. I signed in voluntarily, but I couldn't get out voluntarily. And I was scared. I had this thought, I'd rather die fighting the revolution in the streets than in this place. And I approached the receptionist and asked her to be let out. And of course, she wasn't going to let me out. So I grabbed the table lamp to use as a weapon. And I didn't do anything with it. And the men in the white coats came after me. And uh, when I woke up the next day, I, was, I didn't die like I thought would happen. But what did die is my naivety. And uh, at those days, they always, anyone who was in there had to take Thorazine. That was required. And I can get a little bit more into the medical aspect. Uh, fortunately, I never took any medications long enough to get addicted. I'm so happy that I had that kind of awareness. I might take them for a month or something like that. And, but it became a habit that every time I start hearing voices and thinking about these kind of thoughts, I wind up in a mental hospital, either going in to sign in or being brought in from acting out in some way or another. And most of the time they give these medicines. That was the main treatment. One doctor at a state facility in California told me it's just like a diabetic with insulin. You, you know, you're for life, you have to take this medicine or you'll have a relapse. And this philosophy surprisingly is still around. People believe in this. And that's still promulgated when they prescribe. They don't tell the side effects or the dangers of these medicines. They don't even tell they're addictive. Just take this. You'll feel better kind of thing, you know. And then when you're addicted, if you get off, if you, if you stop taking the medicine when you're addicted, you'll start having all these mental symptoms. And they say, see, you didn't keep taking your medicine. So you're relapsing. And I could go on and on about this aspect, but basically 500,000 people a year die from psychiatric medications all over the world. 500,000, to me, that half a million, that's a genocide. And these authority figures are, and big pharma, along with media promotion, are responsible for this genocide. And most people don't know about it out there. Yeah, they, and it's something that's been going on for the entire history of what has passed for mental and psychiatric care in the Western world. It's pretty much always been barbaric. And I guess what I'm really interested in is how, you know, that paranoia thing, that heightened awareness that then becomes uh, an amplification of a negative awareness. Because that's something that's part of any expansion of consciousness. The highs go higher, the lows go lower. And you, what you're aware of expands in that way and kind of what you focus on, you tend to be drawn towards. And it, it's something we're all experiencing as we go up the sort of spiritual mountain in our life journeys that once you can see from higher up, you can see what's, you can kind of see some of the extremely shady stuff happening down at the lower levels. And especially when it comes to, you know, you're someone for your whole life has been seeming, seems like you've been aware that the, you know, the, social system that we've created is really just an authoritarian form of enslavement of the modern age and government being just another religion really for, for people that they don't uh, make quite as mystical, but they don't realize that it is like a fictional entity that is everyone's kind of bowing down to. But what I'm interested in is that paranoia thing, like that heightened awareness that leads to either one of two things. You can have the paranoia of being too focused in on those negative uh, things you're perceiving, or then there's the concept of pronoia that I really like, which is defined as the feeling that the world 
is actually conspiring in your favor. And that's, that's the most empowering feeling ever. You start noticing synchronicities that are positive, it leads you on sort of a chain reaction. And I think this is like, like I said in the intro, this is like that straddling line between the, the mystic and the, the madman getting into paranoia or pronoia because having that feeling that things are conspiring in your favor, I do think it amplifies things to conspire in your favor in a way. It doesn't take away, you know, harsh reality of different conspiracies against people that exist in the world, but the majority of our vulnerability comes through our fear, not through uh, something that we can't prevent that's coming in from the outside. Yeah. Uh, and another way to frame this would be uh, in terms of spiritual emergence. I didn't feel that was the way I was treated or understood that what I was happening to me at the time is a emergence spiritually, but I did have crisis, which would be called spiritual emergency. I'm sure you've heard of those terms before. That's not the same as pronoia, but it's a, a more positive way of looking at it. The problem, and I was going to talk about this when we mentioned psychedelics and plant medicines. The problem is we do not live in an, in an indigenous shamanistic culture. So when you start taking plant medicines or LSD or something like that, you're running a big risk entering a spirit world that might not be very friendly. For instance, once I, I got into meditating with trees and I sat down at one tree to meditate with my back against it. And this tree said, how dare you try to talk to me? You're a species that cuts us all down and is destroying us. Get the hell out of here. So in indigenous culture, people grow up close to nature and the plants are a part of their life. So taking a plant medicine is natural. For us, it's a very unnatural thing and we can get dragged into a deep, bad place. If you believe in those spirits, even if you don't, you can be dragged there. So I think... There's another concept I better throw in before I forget. And that's that the, my belief is the core human wound is lack of connection. And I'm not talking about an internet connection here necessarily. I'm talking about a connection with nature, with other people, and connecting the different disparate parts of your own self. That's the core wound that we need to work with as human beings in this culture today. And it seems to be getting worse from my perspective as institutions are crumbling and the new light bodies are coming to the fore, so to speak. Yeah, that's actually something I had jotted down uh, in terms of talking about spirits and entities that could be floating around and, you know, not just the spirits of plants, but the spirits of passed on people that are not able to leave the plane, things like that, because we don't have a shamanistically aware culture and there's very few people around that are actually doing that job of helping things move on that are, you know, not supposed to be hanging around anymore because people are literally dying with these, with these types of extreme psychological imbalances. You, you mentioned the light body, the body that you have beyond your physical body, it's still you. So wherever you're at, whenever you, whenever you transition into that body from this body, that's still, you, you're that person, you know, it's, you're that entity. And if you, like, I, there are even cases of people having spirits connected to like a car they bought because the person who owned it previously was really obsessed with taking care of their car and they died and then they just decided to hang around their car. So all kinds of crazy stuff like that, that sensitives and mediums report if you just like talk to those types of people or, or read their books or their blogs. And it seems to me that we definitely are a, attracting things through our fear vulnerability to come live with us and, uh, you know, keep maintaining the vibration that they're addicted to of whatever it might be, be it alcoholism or extreme paranoia. There could be a whole spectrum of events that we're not aware of in terms of almost like spiritual warfare on this plane that we could either be pawns and victims of or actual, I guess, participants consciously in the process where by working on ourselves and our health, especially our health and 
therefore closing up the gaps in our, our auras and fields, we become the beacon that shines enough light that these types of negative spirits or, you know, what we all have our own way of possibly conceptualizing this stuff if it's something we're aware of, but we can actually be the, the healer to that realm too. And I think that's even what is being asked of us by our planet to, to take back up, take that torch back up and help recycle some of the, the destructive energies that we've called forth unconsciously. I don't know if you know of a shaman named Maladoma Somme. He's a, he's from an African tribe, the Dagara in, uh, He's a cultural bridge. He's had two PhDs from the uh, Western culture. And then there's a village that he has, a ceremonial village in uh, Northeast, where people do ritual and ceremony. And I heard him say that the ancestors, they really, that culture really honors ancestors and connecting with them through different shamanistic ways. So he said that basically, when, so, when our ancestors want to accomplish things, they don't have a body to do these things that they know need to be done. They're going to come to us and ask us to do them. And we might freak out hearing these voices telling, you know, go plant some trees or I don't know what they're saying, but, you know, that kind of thing. And I kind of like that. It's a little bit more positive than just disembodied spirits who are unhappy with their lot. It's actually, you know, they're people. So there's all kinds of them, right? Yeah. Sure, and you could we can get into go really go deep into UFOs, extra dimensional beings. I mean, there's no end to it. The, ma the main thing that I focus on is that you know the, the parts of me that are that I'm alien to. Instead of aliens that are out there, I'm kind of interested, but I'm not looking for them. And where I live is supposed to be a mecca for this kind of thing, central highlands of Mexico. But I haven't seen any lights like some of my friends have, and. I say that those things, even if they're real, a lot of it could be a distraction from just getting into and understanding our own selves and working on that level. And some of that's kind of unfortunate, but that's the way that goes. Yeah, what you say actually reminds me of a, a quote that I like from the 20th century psychiatrist and author Thomas Zaz. And he was one of the peop first people in that, I guess, industry or field who was really against the way that psychoanalysis was moving towards just medicating and diagnosing and putting people in little label boxes and stickers. And he says that the self is not something one finds, it's something that one creates. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really big key to the puzzle of what you're saying, you know, looking for the alien parts of yourself to reconnect with, because that that's the way that it needs to be done. Like this entire sh shift in the world that we, you know, that we wish to see is only achievable through the reconnecting that you're talking about. Like you'll never, as much as I love people that go out and really research and bring us awesome information and, and reveal the secrets of like UFO phenomenon, for example, I don't think that that is going to ever fix uh, our world to be chasing that down so much. I think that once we are m more aligned and activating our true individuality, then the types of, you know, maybe technologies that someone might think they could scavenge from UFOs or that the government might actually be scavenging from <laughs> UFOs, it, that what we need will emerge. Just look at, at many of the great inventors of history who uh, supposedly were influenced by a voice or a blueprint or a design just popped into their mind clear as day and they were extremely creative people. So the creative process is what I'm referring to whenever I'm quoting Zaz and saying that the self is something that one creates because it is in getting into your self as a creator that you start teaching yourself new things about yourself because that process itself, whatever form it takes for you, getting into what is your real vocation and it's not an occupation or a recreational thing that is the like that's the biggest i guess the biggest teacher really of all yeah the creative impulse imagination is probably what puts us ahead of animals our ability to 
in our mind create things that are that don't exist and then make them manifest. Talk about the three things you did to help overcome the uh, revolving door of the psychiatrists and uh, medicines, because I thought that was really interesting. It relates to this. I was go- going in and out of hospitals, I guess it was eight times between 1969 and 78. When I got to my last hospitalization, I realized that this wasn't doing me any good at all. I keep going in and out and I'm not getting anywhere. Maybe making things worse, who knows? So I developed this intention that I'm going to do whatever it takes to break this cycle. The intention, that's the first step. And then listening to my inner voice, what needed to happen. And the the inner voice would be the second step. And persisting with that, no matter what's going on outside, who's saying what to do, my inner voice would guide me towards my intention. So. I did a few things. First of all, I adopted what you would call non-compliance. For instance, in the hospital, they're ready to discharge you. They tell you you can come back and get your drugs regularly for free. I refused the drugs. Number two, they wanted me to go to an outreach clinic, to go to meetings, group therapy, and get an individual therapist. I didn't go there. Number three, They gave me, I think they put me on welfare then or something, and uh, they wanted me to live. They gave me a list of where other ex-mental patients lived. And this this is where you should be living. No, I didn't want to be in that milieu anymore. I went off on my own. So all of that you could wrap into one package called noncompliance. A second thing I did, and I don't know how deep we want to get into this, but my career as a scientist and my identity tied into that field was pretty much at an end. While in the first hospitalization, I dropped out of college, and that's a whole scene in itself. So I needed to know who am I? And I, when I was in California, I saw some weavers who were in a commune. I really appreciated their lifestyle. And I thought, I want to apprentice to a weaver and learn how to do this. My friends told me, you'll never find such a thing. Take some workshops. But my inner voice told me, and I persisted. And I found a professor at the university in the art department who was a fiber artist. And he took me under his wing and was a very great guy. And uh, weaving was a, a way of meditating because it's very rhythmic and it's activity, but you wind up with a finished product. And it kept me occupied. So after the apprenticeship, I went to my apartment, worked on my own projects instead of going out in the milieu to the clubs and in the streets. And, and I developed a new identity separate from that old one. So that's part two, non-compliance and uh, the new identity. And the third one, most important, I think, I didn't go to state psychiatrists, state-funded psychiatrists anymore. I would heard about one who was really good, a psychologist. She was private. It took me a while for her waiting list to clear. And I started uh, therapy with her. And she gave me... Uh, a lot of tips. She had a really good analysis for me for what was going on and was extremely supportive. So that part was very important for me. So it took about a year with her to get rid of the voices. After that, I never went back to the hospital. I never took medications. In a few more years of in and out of psychotherapy mainstream, I uh, then did that, and I never went back after 1982 to a mainstream psychotherapist again. So, you know, how has that weaving developed throughout, you know, the course of your life since then? That that seems like such an awesome metaphor, in a way, for what you were doing at that time, because you were disentangling parts of yourself from old identities and groups that really no longer served you and that you didn't want to be a part of anymore, even though it was like the outside world wanted to force you into the, those boxes or that that was the shape your basket was already in. You And then you rewove the strands of self into, like you said, a new identity. That's It is separate from the old one because it's a new form of yourself, but it's made out of everything you learned and the, the pieces and parts of the old self. So I think that's just a, a really cool metaphor. I'm curious how... Like, did that turn into 
sort of a, a vocation for you for a while? Is it something you still do? Have you picked up any other skills creatively that serve a similar function in your life? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the weaving developed into something very interesting. When I was in with that professor, his graduate students created uh, a uh, knitting loom made out of a spool that cable is put on, electrical cable, a big spool where they had pegs going around the perimeter of the spool for doing a knitting, where the knitting would go through the hole in the spool. They brought this into an elementary school and had kids creating these big tubes of netting that they put up in the gym for the kids to crawl in on and through while they were creating more. And I thought, wow, this is a wonderful experience. And I created something community oriented in this way, an educational experience that I initiated at the Cambridge River Festival. I think it was 1979, an outdoor festival where it was a structure, a flat tapestry structure where I incorporated trees as part of the loom, holding the tension. And I'd, I'd create the warp in the weft would be pieces of cloth that people coming by could weave into the structure. And this was very successful. It, I encouraged people to help weave the fabric of community. More recently, I, when I've done this, I talk about a website, you know, and people understand. And I found great numbers of people interacting that normally never do anything, coming together creatively in a sort of a primitive fashion, the way people worked in groups on a structure. There was no plan or design, and I didn't do any teaching because that would drive people away. Instead, I just let them explore and create. When they asked me how to do it, I said, well, just try anything and see what other people are doing. And I had a great fun with this thing. And that became kind of my weaving focus. I learned a lot of techniques, taking workshops and experimenting on my own. And I got associated with a gallery. I had a studio for a while. And I was on the front page of the Berkshire Eagle in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, because I had a workshop in a museum and a photographer liked it. And I thought I was going places, but nobody hired me to do any workshops. I wound up in debt and had to leave that. But I continued to do these kind of workshops, sometimes getting paid, sometimes not. In all kind of venues, even did it in a bar once. It didn't work there. It was too dark. But mostly outdoors. And it was a great fun thing to do. And I was a little bit inhibited to apply for grants to go on the road with this. So it kind of fell by the wayside. And uh, what happened is the plastics industry came in. And I did really don't like working with plastics. And I couldn't afford natural materials. So that was one aspect. Another is that 15 years ago, I moved to central Mexico. And I've tried this a few times here, but it's not the kind of cultural thing. People don't want to expose their creativity in public like that in Mexico. They're more private and shy. So although I've tried it a few times here, it didn't really work. And uh, I don't do much of this myself anymore. Uh, sometimes I make a hat doing finger crochet. But, you know, some other things have come in to replace that, and they've kind of gone by the by that might come back. One is I've taught hands-on sacred geometry workshops. And another is I started building, I moved into a place and a friend gave me some tools and some tips and I started making my own furniture. And uh, that's really rewarding. I really like doing things with my hands and I have to push myself because I'm really too connected to the computer. It's good to get away from that and do, you know, walk barefoot in a park or create a table or something. Yeah, too connected to the computer. Story of my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my my day job is on computers and then I'm making a podcast that's on computers. Sometimes I make websites that's on computers. It definitely makes a difference to do something with your hands, not involving a screen. So, you know, I love to draw. I love to do a little painting. I think everybody should just explore things that are interesting, even if it seems simple or not going to be valuable. Because what you're talking about, you said you did sort of community weaving projects, even at festivals. What, what happened for me at my first couple of festivals I ever went to was seeing 
art and even having the opportunity to participate in some art through like having some community art supplies and, and a wall that everyone can paint on, things like that. And it's just like, you never know when someone walking by will go, oh yeah, I used to love to draw or doodle when I was a kid and I totally repressed that. And here I am having fun and no one's telling me I suck. <laughs> and uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling too good to be critical of myself. I really like what I just drew here on this wall that I'm gonna walk away from and maybe never see again. You know, there's something about that. that it's very magical and it's too bad that it, you know, in central Mexico, you're not able to get people interested in that in the same way because of cult, different cultural conditioning. I think we're very resistant here in the United States, despite all the <laughs> attempts to squeeze the imagination out of kids in schools. I think the imagination is having a huge comeback in the world. And that's basically our key, our number one weapon against uh against evil, darkness, uh, sadness, depression. It's imagining a different way of looking at things, imagining a different way of living. Right? All, of, all of the problems we ever think we have pretty much come from a lack of being able to imagine a different scenario than what you're stuck in, right? So yep. I, I think it's so cool that you, you gave people the chance to have those type of experiences with community art projects like you're describing. I'm curious, since I'm on the subject of festivals, you know, how do you, how have you observed that sort of counterculture scene evolve since Woodstock starting there? I imagine that was early on for you in your uh, career to the decades beyond. Like, what, what do you see for the counterculture movement as it stands today? Do you think we are making any dents in the, in the empire? Okay, I got to put in a plug here for my friend Garrick Beck from Santa Fe and his book, he wrote, um, I think it's called My Stories or something like that. Garrick Beck's father and mother were the founder of what was called the Living Theater in New York City. The Living Theater originated the original hair with nudity in the audience, uh, people coming into the audience naked and kind of, I don't know if you're, probably most of your listeners would be familiar with the Living Theater, maybe not. Anyway, Garrick, was one of the founders of the first Rainbow Gathering, and has been a large behind-the-scenes person in that. And in the introduction to his book, he talks about the New World Order, but he says what's encouraging is this, I hardly ever hear this kind of enthusiasm for what's happening and what's coming up. He calls it the New World Culture. He says if you look at the history, the hippies, the anti-Vietnam movement, the feminist movement, the... Uh, the black movement, the gay movement, the uh, Wall Street movement, uh, Standing Rock, it just keeps building. And there's all these people out there all over the world who are a part of these different movements. They don't disappear, they're still around. So we're one huge conglomerate movement that you could call the new world culture, just kind of waiting and some even pushing for the old one to get out of the way so that we can take over. So that to me is a very positive statement about the present and the near future, the new world culture. That sounds really rad. I like to look at the future that way too, that we're finally going to have the opportunity to make a revolution in consciousness instead of a violent overthrow type of revolution. Because as bad as all these institutionalized things are in our world, it's it's all a, an edifice and a structure that could be retooled, re, you know, rewoven in a way to be completely humane and to our benefit. And it's people, the fact, the fact that a lot of people have to take various jobs that are sort of part of the system, but they might have come from a background of really being passionate about their own freedom or freedom of people like themselves, that gives, that gives them, gives us sort of like secret double agents within the uh within those structures to be more human i guess and less controlled by the, the illusion of the authority that they might be working under because when it comes down to something like a government it's just a collection of people and if we can change ourselves as people then the world is going to change no matter what type of rigidity exists in our institutionalized systems Yes, definitely. And uh, sometimes it's just a matter of bringing 
polar polar opposites together in the right way because the the journalism often portrays things in very simplistic ways but some of these polarities actually have a very complex underpinning and if you bring people together and just introduce them you don't tell them which part of the polarity they're on but you just bring them together they're going to see each other as real people and not as a a gun legislation person or a gun toting person they're going to say that's just this guy over here and then then you later after you know him them as a person you come up with the issues and these issues are not so simple sometimes and if you open up a complexity that it's sort of like how mathematicians and physicists say that the, if you introduce more dimensions, you can explain reality more easily because there's more wiggle room. Well, the way things have been painted with the polarities, there isn't any wiggle room because it's made so simplistic. We need more wiggle room and then we'll see that a lot of us who think we're opposed to this other person over there really aren't so opposed. Yeah, absolutely. It's about finding middle ground between ourselves and others and then also the middle ground in ourselves so that we're not ourselves polarized because i think as soon as you do get into that type of a state then you're blinded to what others have to say a lot of times and it's difficult to talk to a polarized person if you really think they're wrong because as soon as you insinuate that then they're going to just sort of completely reject whatever you have to say so yeah uh, yeah there's confirmation bias and things like that Especially with the internet now algorithmically serving up to people exactly what they're used to looking up and what they want to see and hear, it actually goes quite a ways towards the divisiveness of our, our current time that there's an echo chamber occurring with different groups, I guess. So, yeah, I think it's important, even if you might identify with a, your, your race or your subculture in some capacity, in the end of the day, we got to be individuals and not take anything on dogma, whether it's spiritually or societally. And really, the number one solution to all forms of tyranny or enslavement or or just plain bullying is becoming more self reliant and self dependent. So I think that's something you do help people with in your online work that you've started and another creative task that you've been getting into his writing that I know because I've been reading some of your writing. So in your writing and in your work with clients, what are some of the hurdles that you're seeing as common or types of what types of things do you help people deal with with online counseling? Well, I haven't done a hell of a lot of online counseling, but the last person I work with had trouble with he was depressed and had a lot of trouble with motivation. So what I brought up to him is, well, what motivated you to get in touch with me? Maybe you can take that motivation and use it to achieve what you want to do. But what his motivation was a very negative motivation, unfortunately. After 40 years of being clinically depressed, they gave him a new designation, personality disorder. And I think I'm not a clinician, so I don't know, but my feeling about a label like personality disorder is it's a signal to other therapists saying treatment resistant, among other bad things, heavy attachment issues and treatment resistant. So when I'm, when I'm coaching, I usually try and bring people into thinking more about, well, okay, you got this problem. What else is going on in your life that you do like? Is there any things that you really enjoy? Can you do them every day or more often? Or if they're, Socially, a lot of people have social anxiety these days. It's a lot of it has to do with the internet, cell phones, and growing up lying in your bed texting 24-7 instead of getting out and communicating in person. These people come to college and they don't know how to communicate with somebody else in, a, in front of their face, and they have social anxiety. So I try and direct them to, well, what do you do alone that makes you feel good? Do a little bit more of that and see if that boosts your confidence somewhat. In my writing, I haven't gotten into this kind of thing yet, but I intend to. Mostly my writing is uh, reworking a memoir that I wrote some number of years ago. And after that, I want to break it into three themed memoirs. 
One is based on a blog that I'm already have a monthly article for called Letters from Mexico. This is describing for people who want a vacation or thinking about retirement, what life is like in Mexico. And it's mostly visual, not that many words. So that's going to become an ebook. Then I'm going to have another book called, uh, well, I don't know what to call it yet, but it's going to be the politics of mental health based on my experience and study. And the other one is going to be called Living Woodstock. What I gleaned from the Woodstock Festival that I thought was valuable and still carry in my life up to today. That would be geared towards your age group and maybe younger people to try and give them some ideas for an alternative reality that they could look at as a lifestyle or just a little bit of an inkling instead of being caught up by the matrix and you know, being controlled. Both of those books sound definitely interesting, I think, and we get into the second hour coming up that's for subscribers. I think it would be awesome to talk about some of the stuff that's going to be in those books because you won't be spoiling it to the the whole world for the free show just to the you know the the core little tribe we've got here and I think that a lot of us that, that listen or participate in this podcast are very involved in the festival scene and countercultural movements so yeah we'd love to hear some of your insights from Woodstock and from how you've seen counterculture develop since then I think that would be really cool and then the politics of the mental health institutions I've I've been a huge I guess, studier of psychology and philosophy for a while now. And that's something that I would love to discuss with you too on the other side. But before we take a little break and go cross over, why don't you let people know how they can find you, your website, uh, what materials you might recommend them to check out for uh, what, you're, what you're up to? Sure. My website is my name, doncarp.com, D-O-N-K-A-R-P. And on there, you'll find a journaling workshop that I offer. You'll see my memoir and where to find that, plus a couple of speaking engagements where I was presenting my life and my book. One is five minutes and the other is a longer one. Then I have the blog letters from Mexico there, too. You could subscribe to that. Sometimes I post guest blogs on medium.com. Some of it's just re rehash of letters of Mexico and others are on the mental health field. Uh, I work a lot on Quora.com, Q-U-O-R-A. You could look me up there and look at my profile and see my answers. I'm an expert there on psychosis and other things and probably have about 300,000 views by now. And I'm hoping to get clients through that. That's a very direct way to just help random people. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was into guest blogging for a while and it took its toll and I, it just too much this is a very short way of getting to people and you would you'd be surprised at the number of people that are asking about depression or schizophrenia or just uh what do i do with my mother-in-law she's hoarding all these things and is it is, is she mentally ill they'll ask and there's a lot of good questions that come in there and i try and answer as many as i can a lot of them i have to throw out because i don't know just don't know it's funny how google has become the alternative for, you know, like talking to your friend about something. <laughs> you might, yeah. I'm sure people still bring up their issues to their friends all the time, especially people that are very focused on what they perceive as their problems can tend to almost make that all you hear about. So, but it is interesting how it's almost like someone's search history is a reflection of what's going on in their mind. And in a weird way that allows some of us to get more easily manipulated because that type of data is being raked in and piled up by our, our governments and institutions to maintain as complete of a psychological profile on each and every citizen as they can possibly have for national security reasons or whatever. <laughs> I'd like to give you a couple more references for, for people. Websites, one that's really good is Mad in America, madinamerica.com for both a lot of psychiatrists and professional people provide input as well as people with lived experience like me. They have courses, they have a forum in ongoing. The other one is called the Icarus Project, the Icarus Project.net. 
and they have some wild guys like you who do radio broadcasts and uh, they provide information about getting off of psychiatric drugs and other very down to earth kind of stuff. So with those two, you should be able to locate an awful lot of stuff online and off. There are actually peer support chat groups online for people who are too scared or just live rurally or something and want to be with other people going through what they're going through. You can find this online now. It's great. My most current project is to create an international co-housing village in a small town where I live in central Mexico with a focus on elders being the core group of the community with everyone welcome but and it's it's a big project i think that's brilliant because we have a serious problem of shutting our elders out pushing them into homes and keeping them away at arm's length or or further in our our culture and you know i've seen people go through hospice and that type of experience and i really don't believe that we are meant to have such a diminished experience of life in old age. And that I, because I've known so many older people that were vibrant and flourishing all, all the way through their lives. So I think that's a great idea and something the world needs. Yes. One thing we talked about earlier is polarities and that you would be amazed. What I've come up against is all kinds of different ideas that I don't ascribe to. Like, and so I got to get down to, okay, what are negotiable needs and what are non-negotiable needs? For instance, one friend says, I want to live with young people. If you say it's a community for elders, vibrant and active youth are not going to join. Well, I have to disagree with them. I think it depends on how you promote the thing and how you're arranging all this. Another person is, I want to create a mixed wealth community. In other words, do fundraising and have low, lower cost rentals for a lot of my friends like me who are on Social Security with no savings. Other people are trust fund babies. So a way to do that would be to re- give, a, give up your tax returns and create a sliding scale on the monthly fees. Well, one friend says he doesn't want to expose his tax returns. Another item was... Uh, my idea is to have a development company come in and build everything to have a uniformity. doesn't mean everything's going to look exactly the same, but maybe everything will be Adobe, different levels and different. And another friend says, no, I'm going to build my own house and create my own design. So it's all interesting how all these different polarities come up, and I'll be curious to see how I work them out. But Creating a community is not reinventing the wheel. There's a lot of them out there, and I'm going to get information before I proceed too much further. Yeah, there's some information. If anyone's interested in this, they should contact me, whether they're in the United States or Russia, Finland, Antarctica, or in Mexico. If you're interested, this is going to happen. I'm pretty sure that fundraising would appreciate the lower cost and more effectiveness of elders living in a village where they're taking care of each other instead of a nursing home. Those places cost so much money and are so ineffective at producing a positive lifestyle that any fundraising should not be a difficult thing. Yeah, I think caring for each other ought to be a community-oriented thing, not a a job-oriented thing as much as possible, for sure. It sounds like a good intention that you've got uh, springing there. So I definitely going to want to stay in touch and find out how that's developing. We can talk Thanks. about that more in the future. Yeah. I like that. And I think because those type of communities are oriented on helping people solve their problems and not sort of creating a, almost like a mental illness culture, like when they try to stick you with a bunch of ex institutionalized people, whenever you are getting out of your treatments, I think this is a different way. And I like it. It allows people to go their own pace and look for what they want to look for. And I think these type of resources should be kept in mind, not just for ourselves, because I know a lot of us listening or at this stage of wanting to be, you know, in self-development and self-empowerment are not really in, even necessarily needing tools like that. But you, I'm sure you might know somebody who could benefit from checking out this type of stuff. 
and that doesn't, you know, they are still a little identified with their neuroses or, or the challenges to the point where you might be able to give someone just the right little piece of information they needed by telling them about Don's uh, videos, like seven minute video could be really helpful or you never know. So it's good to keep this stuff in mind and we'll catch you guys on the plus extension if you're subscribers. Otherwise, thanks for uh, being with us on the free show, Don. Sure. I appreciate the opportunity and hope that some people find something that's useful there. And there's another great conversation in the can added to the archive. Big thank you to Don Carp for coming on the show, which may not have happened without the help of former Interverse guest Linda Clay. Thank you for putting me in touch with this awesome guy. Really enjoyed speaking with the Don, not just because psychology is one of my favorite things, but because he seems pretty fearless about his conquering of his own psychosis, and he does a great job using his story to be helpful and empowering to others. One thing I wanted to bring up in the episode but didn't remember was the etymology of the word psyche, which is the root for psychology and psychiatry. You might already know, but this word psyche is actually Greek for soul. And although the mainstream version of psychology these days tends to emphasize that it's some kind of examination and treatment of the mind, a true psychological approach has to factor in the soul component because the mind is really an outgrowth of that. Ignoring it is what leads to the mechanized and robotic methodology of tackling every potential problem with a different pill prescription. So we don't want that. The other great thing about Don was as a festival lover, it was really cool to hear about the emerging counterculture of the 60s and what Woodstock was like. That was kind of more in the plus extension. If you didn't catch the plus extension, though, because you're not a subscriber yet, this episode would be a great place to jump on board. It's just $5 a month. You get access to double length interviews here on your favorite podcast. And it only makes sense to double your pleasure and your fun if you're getting anything good out of the free show which I would hope you are. Seems like it's doing all right to me. I have some shout outs due for a few of you new Plus Tribe friends. So a big thank you to Karen Lee, who has been a recurring big donator for a long time. So grateful to have you on board. Also newer subscribers, Matt Brake, Pablo Zambrano, Dana Miles, and Jamie or Jaime Konopka. Konopka? I'm sorry about botching that one, but... <laughs> I'm excited still. Anytime someone new signs up for Plus, it's like I get infused with cosmic creative energy that aligns my chakras and puts me in the perfect podcast zone or something like that. Mostly it just makes me happy that some of you out there are getting to hear the bonus content because I think it's great and I wish everyone could hear it, but I have to draw a line somewhere and make a way for you all to reciprocate the energy I put into the podcast. So that's what Plus is. You get double the length episodes. You get early access. Some of the things Don and I talked about in this extension included the values and lessons learned from the original Woodstock Festival and also learning to be a good listener and healing through compassionate conversation. What was and wasn't adopted from the Iroquois Confederacy Native Americans by the United States Constitution, the disease gene myth. That's a really interesting one. I I uh, personally don't think that we're locked into any kind of exact gene expression or DNA prison. And our consciousness epigenetically controls our gene expression and our environment too. Look up the work of Dr. Bruce Lipton. That's a great thing to, great rabbit hole to dive into. We talked about the problem with long-term psychiatric medication and the thousands that die from prescriptions. One thing I wanted to say, but I didn't during the episode, is just how demonic most of these medications actually sound when you read their name out loud, like Zyzol, Xanax, uh, maybe not all of them. Some of them are more tricky, like Allegra. You know, they, they just are weird little sigil sound combinations that they don't mostly sound like something good. Anyway. We also talked about breaking the psychic cataracts that cloud our spiritual awareness by doing creative activities. I'm a big believer in that. I sometimes will just go pick up my guitar for a few minutes these days and get out of whatever lack of motivation I might be feeling or just sort of, I don't know, it just totally de-stresses me, lets me see the big picture again, which is, surprise, here's the big picture, folks. You are infinite. You are nature. 
You are everything. It's all inside of you. That means you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. And the only repercussions that might come from that are if you are harming others, you're therefore harming yourself. So that's how it works, guys. That's the big secret of the universe. <laughs> Keep that in mind at all times as much as possible. How our food choices impact our energy and sanity levels is a big part of that. And we talked about that in the plus extension. We also talked about advice for dealing with hazardous environmental energy like electromagnetic fields. There was more than that, and it may sound like a lot, but really I just scratched the surface of describing the convo that I had in the plus extension with Don Carp. Make sure and get over to patreon.com forward slash interverse to sign up if that is something that you are interested in. You'll get the full archive of extended episodes, and you can find links for that in the show notes with all the links to what Don's doing and the things we t talked about today. Also check the notes for a link to Ichisan. That's the music producer featured in this episode. Really great, kind of like disco, techno, I don't know, genres, right? Great things coming up for Interverse in the near future, though. We recently debuted our first booth at a full-fledged music festival. And me and the lady, Haley, are hoping to do a lot more of that soon. We did our first music festival booth at Elevate, which is near Springfield, Missouri. It was a lot of fun. And if it pleases the king and we get our like tax numbers and certifications and all that shit sorted out, we'll be doing more stuff really soon. Government paperwork is a good enough argument for anarchy all by itself. If you've ever dealt with it, you probably agree. But it's cool to be taking this journey of bringing my dream for Interverse to life and hopefully bringing you all with me on it. Some events I'm hoping to be at coming up are the Dark Light Revival in Bentonville, Arkansas on October 13th which is a 3D interactive blacklight art experience, and also the Infected Mushrooms and Friends show on October 20th in Elkins, Arkansas. I'm going to try to be vending at at least one of those, definitely attending both. If you caught me at Elevate Music Festival a couple weekends back, thank you for checking out the show and letting me talk your ears off at that event. As much as I love making this podcast and sitting here alone in my studio on the computer, the real magic is when we get to meet out there in the third dimensional meet space. And that's it for September. Amazingly, I managed to get four episodes out this month, which is my goal. And things look pretty good for October to be shaping up the same way. Scheduling is tricky for me, but I am figuring it out. I've got some exciting guests on the roster next month, including the modern bard and whimsical wordsmith Laurel Arica, who is going to be a lot of fun, I guarantee. She's coming up next week. Check the Interverse Podcast group on Facebook and, and on Minds and places like that if you want to get updates on things like guests who are coming up. You can throw out questions you might want to ask them through me. I don't know. I want to get more involved with you guys online and offline, so please get in touch with me however you see fit. I've never been more excited about Interverse, and I'm really happy you guys are with me. I hope you're finding this path to your liking as together we move towards a more creative and authentic life. And that's about it. Yeah, much love to all of you. Remember, you are what you eat. Keep being stoked about life because that's what summons the synchronicities and serendipities. Stay in a steady state of excitement. Anyway, thanks for listening. See you on the next show.